So it's been about over three weeks since I beat Rance 3. If you haven't seen my video about my thoughts for the first three Rance games, let me catch you up. My experiences with 01, 02, and especially 3 were all pretty damn great. While they all have their respective flaws regarding their gameplay, I've absolutely loved the various character interactions between Rance and his many hot bitches throughout each title, and seeing how each game has started to improve on itself in regards to the overall plot, character development, and the world itself has been really enjoyable. This made me really excited to continue going through the series and start Rance 4. So now that I've beaten it, and I've gathered my thoughts a bit, let's take a look at Rance 4, Legacy of the Sect. Unlike Rance 1 through 3, which all have a remake, Rance 4 currently does not have a remake, and as far as I know, there isn't one plan. So if you want to experience this game for yourself, you're gonna have to play the good old original. Let's first take a look at the overall aesthetic and art for this game. In the previous video, I mentioned finding the aesthetic of Rance 3 to honestly be pretty enjoyable and have a cute 90s charm to it, even if it's a bit scuffed at times. This game honestly took the original art direction from that game and enhanced it tenfold. Not to say that suddenly Rance 3 is ugly or something, far from it, but man, the art in this game is so gorgeous. It still retains the original and lovable sprite 90s art vibe, but the quality is much, much higher. The various character portraits for the town sections, the battle art, and the plentiful CGs in the game are all fantastic and super visually pleasing. The backgrounds for the various locations are all great too, and plenty of them all have cute details in the background that make them a joy to look at. If there's any problem I have with how this game looks, it's, well, the great color scheme they use for the text boxes for the dialogue or as the filler background color. I guess they wanted to use a different color other than black because sometimes they have character portraits bigger than the background image and filler space or overlap them both a bit, and if the filler background were black too, it'd look a bit off, I guess. But even if this makes sense, I still don't really like the choice for that. I definitely thought at first that my game was bugged or something, because the choice of a grey aesthetic threw me off for a bit. It's not like this is a deal breaker or something, it doesn't suddenly ruin how the game looks. But it was definitely my least favorite aspect of the aesthetic for the game. So what about the music? I thought pretty highly of the music from Rance 3, and this game is no exception. While I do feel like one of the weaker elements of Rance 4 are how the actual dungeons themselves look, which I'll elaborate on later. One thing I do have to give credit to the soundtrack is how it can still make certain areas pretty memorable in a way, thanks to the music alone. Most unique sections of each area have a specific song, which helps a lot. While I'd have to give the edge to Rand's 3 battle themes as a whole, this game still has some pretty enjoyable tunes. The final boss song in particular is no slouch. Not to mention the songs that play for various story bits in the town sections are all pretty banging and have definitely ended up stuck in my head as a result. Now, how about the gameplay of Rance 4? How does it compare to Rance 3? Well, let's start. The battles themselves take the same tactical RPG system from Rance 3, where all your characters are spawned on a grid map with the enemies in random places, except this game features a few differences. For one, this time, your members can actually be manually controlled, instead of everyone being an AI besides Rance. While I didn't particularly dislike the AI-heavy feeling of Rance 3 as much as some people did, I do think that this is definitely an upgrade. This game is still pretty easy, and each battle isn't some godlike strategy fest, but it's a more enjoyable experience for your choices to actually matter, I feel like. Since every character can be actively controlled, the way skills work are a bit different too. While in Rance 3, every character can basically spam all their skills with no sort of cooldown, besides some possibly recharging stamina, and Rance can spam his Rance attack with basically no repercussion, this game puts your attacks on cooldown after you've used them for a certain amount of turns. Each attack has its own specific cooldown length. Some can be as short as 2 or 3 turns, while others can be up to 7 or 8. This is to prevent certain really strong AoE attacks and omega strong single target ones to be overly spammed. I can especially understand, as there's far more characters that are able to get AoE moves, while in Rance 3 only Shusuka really had one, until two pretty late game people joined. You might be wondering, oh, does it still have a timer on your healing spell too? And the answer is yes, actually. But honestly, I feel like the game is pretty balanced around this, so it doesn't feel unfair or anything. For one, you're able to use healing items and attack or move on the same turn, and you can chug as many of them as you want. So even if your seal is on cooldown for healing someone, you can still keep people alive pretty easily. Plus, by doing side quests for the shopkeeper, you can make the prices of healing items to be as cheap as 3 gold, 
For an item that heals 60 HP, that you can see every turn you're in trouble basically. This is definitely a life saving for later boss fights. Another thing to take into account is that the enemies all have set AI for how they prioritize attacking your characters. They first will prioritize hitting anyone who's directly adjacent to them first, even if let's say there's a character a space away who you killed by their attack or something. If, in the instance of two characters being adjacent to the enemy, or who they prioritize to move and attack, there's also a set order of who they prioritize first, with France being on top. With how easy it is to manipulate the AI to attack specific characters and being able to heal whenever you want, still not being able to infinitely spam heal isn't honestly too big of a downside. The cooldown is still respectable enough to where if you do need it and don't want to waste a final heal item before ending a fight or something, you'll probably be able to use it too. Your items can also be basically saved for only battles as well. As for the camp menu, you'll be able to do the same rest command from O2, except this time it'll actually hear HP, too, at the cost of an in-game hour, which I'll go into a bit later. For whatever it's worth, I can commend them for actually trying to add some balance to their gameplay this time around, showing a bit of potential, I guess, for how future entries will eventually have pretty commendable gameplay. The only real problem I have with this specific change is that sometimes, mainly late game, enemies are really not that strong but have a fuck ton of HP. This can often lead to battles not really involving any type of strategy, but more so just spamming basic attacks until your strong ones are off cooldown, using a fuck ton of HP restoring things on rants. Enemies like the final boss or the infamous stone guardians which you can't escape from are all not really challenging, but more so just waste your time it feels like. While I can cut the game a bit of slack, as sometimes older JRPGs just relied on the hee hee make HP number big and nothing else, I'm still not gonna fully excuse it. I definitely miss the option of having Omega strong moves being spammed just for these instances, because they just feel like endurance tests rather than actual strategy or even actual fun gameplay. I did enjoy the bit of strategy element of saving your strongest moves for the most annoying enemies in a specific encounter, so it's not all bad. Just a bit unfortunate that the HP scaling towards the end is rather ass. Like Rance 3, this game features auto battle too. However, the AI is a lot more brain lit than they were in the previous entry, which is quite strange. For 1, in 3, the AI always either moved up in range to do melee attacks, or would either spam their magic attacks at a safe range, or if they have to get closer to use something, they'd move up. In this game, sometimes the AI can just not move at all. If, for instance, a character maybe is in their way, instead of going around to reach the enemy regardless, they'll just sit on their ass and not do anything. It's really infuriating. While, unlike Rans 3, you're able to cancel all auto battle and maybe fix their stupid positions, it's still super annoying. Sometimes it's just more of a pain than it's worth, which sucks. Plus, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience, so maybe it's not the same for everyone, but I feel like the AI in this game were extra talented at just putting themselves in the worst possible situations too. However, while I think the encounter rate itself is lower than the 1 in 3, it's still extremely obnoxious when, for instance, you're lost on where to go and have to deal with even more encounters, that auto battle might just be too stupid to actually get through mobs until you're way more beefed up. Plus, plenty of rooms can just randomly have a fuck ton of enemies that you're forced to fight. Not just for story progression or something, but even just random dud rooms that you wouldn't expect unless you're using a guide. That can get really frustrating. I don't think that auto battle should be the end all be all of the battles in any particular game, as surprise surprise, I do in fact usually like actually playing my game. But in instances like this with random encounters while you're just trying to explore, in those battles not adding any sort of depth to the game, it's just more of a downside that auto battle sucks so much. One thing I didn't mention is that you're able to set a special auto option, which allows you to pick 4 moves that your character would only use, which can actually allow you to bypass special attack cooldowns, as you can select the same move 4 times and they just continue to use that same move over and over again. This addition is cool I guess, and normally I'm all for giving unique options for auto battle situations, but due to the affirmation problems, I didn't really utilize this feature at all, as it was just far more trouble than it was worth. All in all, while auto battle can work once you're super high level versus generic mobs, for the majority of the game, it's just not worth it, which is unfortunate. But that's enough about the battles, how about the dungeons themselves? 
While Ranch 3 had a more traditional dungeon exploring feel, similar to something you'd see in standard JRPGs, Ranch 4 takes a different and more unique approach, more similar to how dungeons in Ranch 2 look. Except, I guess the main gimmick of sorts is that basically, while I've been saying dungeons in regards to this game, it's more akin to one really big dungeon. There are multiple entrances, but in the end, everything is all intertwined. Rather than your objective being going from point A to point B type of thing, it's more like finding a specific room that contains a certain item needed to open a locked door, or some cutscene to get deeper in a certain section, and relying more on your own memory to access specific sections to continue. Whether or not you prefer this to the dungeons and Rancor is just completely up to you. I personally didn't vibe with it that much. Each map, or layout, has basically the same color scheme, and as far as I know, there isn't a map that shows every single floor at once, leading for each area to just completely blend together in my memory. Even with a guide, sometimes I would get lost because I couldn't remember how to access a specific room or area, because all of them look the fucking same. I very much struggled with putting together the particular name of their respective area. I probably would have appreciated a bit more if the color schemes could stand out a bit more from each other, or actually having a functional map. I understand that the darker colors fit the vibe of the towers more, but in terms of actually playing through it, it kinda sucked. While, like I mentioned earlier, the specific tracks helped a bit in this aspect, it still wasn't enough for me to really dig through going through these dungeons. Plus, sometimes the game expects you to go through every single room in order to get certain collectibles necessary to progress, but putting seemingly no more rooms just fucking filled with enemies that you have to fight. Obviously, punishing a player for choosing a wrong choice with more random battles isn't something exclusive to this game. It just felt particularly frustrating here due to the aforementioned problems I have with auto battle and just how annoying it can be when you're trying to figure out what to do. But in the end, I can totally understand if you super vibe with this sort of thing too. It definitely has a more unique kind of novelty to it, and it does make it stand out in my mind. Not trying to say something has to be unique to be good, or that if something is more simple it's bad, but for the experience of this game, I'm not against a new take or feel for something. I definitely find this to be more fun than Ransom 2's dungeon, probably due to a combo of better game design and the battles being less lame. Let's move on to something that was changed for the better from Rans 3, the EXP system. The EXP system is better designed now, and the game actually encourages you to level up now, a well appreciated change. For those unaware, the most optimal way to get through Rance 3 is to basically stay at your base level 10, or close to it, up until basically the final boss. This is because the EXP you gain for your whole party scales through Rance's level to an extreme extent, even though the party members join at a far higher level than them. This leads to it almost being a detriment to using your EXP earlier as you want to be able to stockpile as much XP as possible for the absurd final boss. I'm not going to go into all the specifics about it here, as I already did in my previous Rance video, but that's the main gist. Rance 4 still has that feature of sorts, but you'd gain more XP the lower your level is, so there is still a benefit to not dumping all your XP immediately at once. But this time, the game does motivate you more to level up your characters to continue on and make your life easier. For one, you start at level 1, instead of level 10 here, and within the first 20-30 to 30 minutes, you're told to basically level the fuck up so that you can meet the first boss, so you can have Silla back in your party and progress the plot. You at least have to get to level 6, so you can have access to the Rance attack and be able to actually beat her. By this, you can probably figure out that not only will your character stats get better from leveling up, but at certain level benchmarks, they'll learn new and stronger skills. While Rand Strike didn't really have any incentives to level up much outside of a few fights, the skills your characters can get can often be even game changing and make your life a whole lot easier. Plus, better stats never hurt anybody. For instance, Hellfire Conflagration, a fire spell that hits everyone on the map, was originally an attack only Shuzuka had in Rand 3, which means it was obviously locked to the AI. In this game, however, after a high enough level, Seal is able to learn this spell too, which I'm sure you can imagine how nice it is to have access to that. Plus, Seal isn't the only one too. Shizuka is playable in this game too, and while her availability is a bit more limited, she still has access to that spell too, meaning you can have access to more than just one usage of that spell per turn. Past a certain level, Hanami gains access to a similar Spire spell that's able to hit everyone on the map too, giving her a much needed use and option for utility. While her main niche is that she's a dodge tank of sorts, she can still crumble a little too easily. But with this move, 
It gives her a special niche. As of her move and the aforementioned mages, you can spend multiple AoE moves in one turn. Okay, and plus she's just really cute, so I'm not complaining about this. There's other instances of upgrading skills and giving characters more utility or just plain stronger options, which definitely encourages actually using your EXP. I don't recommend dumping every bit of EXP and over leveling, but it's actually a pretty balanced turn that you'll be fine whether you maybe stay under leveled a bit longer and get more EXP, or level up a bit more liberally to have less issues with encounters. This is definitely a change I'm happy about. Money also works a bit differently now too. Instead of receiving money at the end of each battle like normal, you don't actually get cash from most encounters normally. From battles, only a specific treasure lump enemy, which has a random appearance rate, can drop gold occasionally. Though the amount appears to be completely random and they can also drop treasure instead. However, this isn't as bad as it seems. Remember when I mentioned that time system earlier? This is one of the parts where it's relevant. There are in-game days, and for some things throughout the game, you can only do certain events once per in-game day. One of these events is every day, you can go to the Youth League Associate Building and bully the staff for 200 gold for no repercussion. Since you're able to do this every day, this is by far the most consistent source of income. There are also various events throughout the game that can drop a ton of cash at once. Also, at some point in the game, there's another party of characters who will eventually join up and team up with Francis' group, and that group joins up a big load of cash as well. What also happens to assist the economy in this game is that you can also make prices for items and weapons in the shop pretty goddamn cheap by doing side quests to raise the shopkeeper's affection. While her quests aren't available immediately, you're able to complete them without too much trouble, so it's definitely worth doing. Plus, various rooms tend to get out some pretty good armor for free, or at the cost of fighting a ton of enemies in one room. So, what this all leads to is a game with a rather unique feeling regarding money and making decisions to upgrade weapons and armor. In Rants 3, there was a far more limited selection of armor and weapons. While a bit understandable, as each armor did have far, far more impact than the next, by the end of the game, you kind of just stockpile a fuck ton of cash and never need to spend any of it. But in this game, you do actually have to kind of pick and choose a little more carefully for which weapons and armor you pick to beef up Rants with which is a pretty neat experience. You're never drowning in money, but you're never completely dirt poor either, as there's ways to get around and deal with it. So all in all, even if it's something minor in the grand scheme of things, I still like it. Before I continue, let me just briefly elaborate on the time system. There's no way to check the time in game, as far as I'm aware, and there's no time or day limit for anything, like maybe what you think of in Pikmin. The only type of warning, or hint I guess, to what time it is, is that when it hits 7pm in dungeons, Sue will warn you that it's almost night time and that you'll be forced to leave at 8pm to the diner, which is the base of sorts for Ransom Crew. The next day, Sue will ask whether you want to head back to the exact same spot you were in a dungeon before leaving. Just be warned that this is a one-time offer. If you say no, you'll have to backtrack your way there essentially. But I think this is kind of an interesting design choice. If you choose to proceed, you'll obviously be right back at where you were, only taking a break for a free heal essentially. But if you do, it means you can't restock on items or get your free 200 gold from the associate, or maybe do some other quests you unlock. So you could either just proceed as normal, or treat it as a free backtrack and do some other things before returning to the same point. My only dislike about this system is that if you fat finger the no button on the option, you'll be forced to backtrack regardless, as there's not a are you sure prompt or anything. Wait, <laughs> why would that happen? Who could let that happen to them? <laughs> all in all, the gameplay definitely has its fair share of problems and a very fair share of jank. Some things annoy me far more than I would have liked. But I can still appreciate a lot of the positive changes and new ideas that this game brought to the table. It's a pretty unique experience and one I'm glad I got to go through. So, now that I've finally covered everything about the gameplay, let's get into the main appeal and meat for the game, the story and character interactions. Rand's Forest's story and writing is most likely my personal favorite out of the games I've played so far, which is honestly a pretty impressive feat considering how much I really enjoyed Rand's 3's story. And knowing that it's only going to get better from here is so exciting! Like with Rand's 3, the best aspect of this game by far is the character interaction and how everyone is written. Rant's story felt like the start of characters starting to show a bit more depth and make them more interesting. This game continues that same trend, except to an even greater degree. 
Part of what was so fascinating about going through this game is seeing how returning characters continue to get fleshed out and becoming even more likable. The new characters are also all pretty damn interesting and enjoyable, and I definitely appreciate what they add to this game. Let's do a rundown for some of my favorite characters and dynamics here. I won't be covering any major spoilers here, so don't worry! Obviously, as with the previous games, Rance is just a complete joy to experience throughout this entire story. His dialogue and monologues are just some of the funniest things I've ever gotten to experience, and his interactions are always great. There are plenty of fucking hilarious moments, to the point where you can make a whole video of just discussing his best moments alone. However, what's more interesting to discuss for this game specifically is that this game continues to add more and more depth to his character, showing that there is more to him than just being a complete horny, stupid bitch and like being a complete asshole. For one, this game does fully establish that Rance does actually have some sort of a morality scale, which is done throughout, but was especially notable to me involving two specific new characters in this game, Io, and another character I'll purposely not name, to keep it a surprise for if you play the game. I'm not trying to paint Rance as suddenly a good person who could do no wrong, that is completely far from the truth. But this game feels like the first instance of Rance actually putting his foot down and saying enough is enough and also showing a bit more sympathy for certain characters. Let's first look at Ayo, a character introduced in this game. They meet soon after you reobtain Syl and begin your adventure fully. Pretty soon after, you basically find out she's akin to a female version of Rance. She loves teasing and humiliating the fuck out of people, especially Syl, throughout. She has a similar horny energy and is also bisexual, so she doesn't shy away from having sex with Syl or other women, or throwing herself between Rance and Syl. Naturally, it is pretty funny seeing Rance and Io team up and share their crude thoughts of each other. However, there is a pretty key difference between these two. Rance only cares about himself and his own interests the most. While he does, well, you know, girls who may not fully consent to this throughout the games, it's never out of malice for them, but purely because he wants to get some action with more cute girls. If he has to do things like torture or cruel interrogations, it's only because of something like he needs whatever information to continue on with his adventure, and not because he wants to see these girls suffer. Ayo, on the other hand, is just a pure sadist. She likes to torture and humiliate people purely because seeing others suffering and dealing with misfortune pleases her immensely, regardless of who it is. Relatively early on in the game, Ayo, Rance, and Syl find a female knight named Sanakia who had essentially been stuck in a state similar to Kyrosasis for a long ass time, who's about to be used to conduct a horrible experiment. After defeating the big bad boss, of course, Rance and Ao decide to, well, you know, do sinful actions to her. What you notice during the scene is that Ao is especially harsh and cruel to her, far more than Rance's goofy comments during these types of moments. She even goes as far as trying to stick the sheath of her sword inside of her, because she remarks that it would fuck her up and break her forever. This is when Rance firmly puts his foot down and makes Ayo stop it completely. While obviously, Sanakia is still understandably mad at Rance for his other actions beforehand, the point is that he, out of his own will, stopped Ayo before it got even worse. It proves that he still has a concept of morals, and when things are going too far, he put an end to it. This particular scene honestly kind of stuck with me, and made me really impressed and eager to see more of Rance's character being explored. While I absolutely love the complete comedy factor of him, I also am super excited to see how they continue to dive into his character and make him even more fleshed out. And we get another hint of this a bit later on. Let's go back and reference a character who I mentioned I will not name. Her original role as being one of the main psychic super who is basically the main villain, bitch. She was essentially the main brains of the group, giving out the necessary knowledge for him to complete his objectives. However, bitch leaves this girl behind, calling her useless and unnecessary, and she joins up with Francis' group since she has no other choice. What we find out a bit later on is that she had been with bitch ever since she was younger, and had constantly been used by him, in all the ways I'm sure you can think of. If you invite her over to Rance's room at night, she'll show all of her scars from her childhood to him. It really paints the picture of just how fucked up Bitch is, and why her self-esteem is painfully low. During this scene, Rance makes a firm decision to not fuck her, out of feeling sympathy in the pain in her heart. Well, he still wants to have sex with her, but he makes a decision not to until he finally kills Bitch, so he can show her what it's like to be honestly loved. 
This was another particular moment I really enjoyed reading. Rance being able to honestly sympathize with her and put off his decision at that moment for honestly the greater good is something that I really appreciated. Obviously, in the end, he still wants the girl, but it shows that he's not some cold, immune robot to all feelings and things like this. Let's look at what the writing does for some of the other returning characters now. For one, let's look at Maria. Maria was first introduced in Rance 2, and once she was freed from being evil Maho Shoujo, her main relevant note was creating big machines and being a strong assist for Rance. Her main tools, such as her powerful tulip number 3, were essential to getting through Rance 3 and clearing some powerful obstacles. In this game, her machinery is once again relevant. As since France and Seal are trapped on a floating island, wait, that's actually pretty surprising, isn't it? Don't worry, I'll get to that later. So anyway, since they're trapped on this island which otherwise has no easy way to escape, she builds up a whole ass plane which is able to fly over to their location. Alongside her are various characters from the previous games, such as Shizuka, Kanami, Rick, and so on. As they land, they all decide, well, who will be the leader of this group? And the role is forced upon her, despite her showing clear reluctance against it. This allows for a character to show a bit more depth to it. While in 2 and 3 she did seemingly have a more positive and cheery attitude, this game shows that she honestly has quite low self-esteem and doesn't value herself as much as she should. She's constantly worried and afraid to leave the team off track. While something like this is small, it's something I still really appreciate seeing. It just makes me excited and look forward to how they continue to expand on her character and what kind of development she'll receive. Rick is a character who was initially in Rance 3, although he didn't have any super noteworthy character traits or development. His main shtick was that he was considered the strongest general in Fighter for Lasis. This game actually manages to give him a bit more screen time and make him a more noteworthy character, and one I'm actually looking forward to seeing more of now. One of my personal favorite things about him is how he affects the gameplay. He's arguably the strongest unit in the game, or at the very least, definitely the most tanky and just an overall complete powerhouse. The only character who could compete is maybe Rance, but Rance needs to level up a fuck ton in order to be able to compete with Rick's raw strength. This means that normally, you'd always want him in your party, provided the game allows it. However, there's actually a catch. In certain segments of the game, you're required to have France, well, you know, be your Rance in order to progress the plot. This could involve some sort of indecent action. However, if Rick is in your party, he'll actually stop Rance from committing certain things, and in order to progress, you'll have to leave Rick behind and then return to the part of the dungeon. The backtracking part can be a bit lame, although since you can change your party when you return to the diner at night and then immediately return the next day, it's not too bad. I think that from a story perspective, this decision is really cool and can encourage maybe not bringing Rick to certain parts of the game and not relying on him as much. It also paints just how strong his morals are as he deposes and stops even Rance, the all-powerful protagonist here. Plus, the interactions between these two are just fucking hilarious. While some segments aren't blocked by Rick being in the party, he'll still voice his displeasure at certain things and change how Rance can act in certain scenarios with France being extremely pissy and wanting to beat the shit out of Rick the whole time. It's hard to truly explain how good they are together without reading it all yourself, but I promise that it's one of the many highlights of the game. For another character, let's take a look at Syl, Rance's slave that we all know and love. As of Rance 1 through 3, their dynamic is still by far the best out of any duo throughout the games, and even honestly one of my favorite duos in media as a whole. While other characters get a bit more accustomed to Rance's bullshit of each entry, Syl still has a level of familiarity with him that the other characters can't really rival with, especially considering that they fucking live together and are basically inseparable. In instances where they do get separated, they each have the utmost priority to find each other. I don't want to get too much into spoiler territory regarding events for Syl, but I want to stress as much as I can that this game really just paints how good of a character Syl is. Because of her dynamic with France often being on the comedic end, with her being gonked on the head and then recovering instantly, and her cute pink fluffy hair, you might just kind of gloss over her as a silly teehee sidekick kind of character. But this game really started to show that she's a lot stronger than she gives the impression of. While at first, Rance bought her off a spell that forced her to obey him no matter what, that spell has long worn off. Despite his goofy treatment of her, Syl truly loves Rance from the bottom of her heart and genuinely only wants him to succeed and be happy. Over the course of these four games, multiple characters have tried to dissuade her, convince her to fall in love with someone else, and even threaten her that if she stays in love with Rance, 
she'll actually be killed. But she always denies it and stays honest to her true feelings even if it puts her life at risk. She continues to do possibly self-sacrificial actions all for the sake of helping Rand succeed. What's also great is that while it's always been obvious, especially in O2 and 3, that Rand truly cares a ton for Syl too, even if he doesn't want to admit it, this game paints that fact even further with their interaction throughout the game, but also the ending, which is the best ending by far out of these first four games. Not only is this my favorite ending so far, but it's also arguably my favorite single moment throughout these four games. It was so, so well done, and knowing that the writing gets better and better for each entry makes me so excited to see how these two will continue to develop together. Shizuka is relevant in this game too, and while she doesn't have some mind-blowing development or anything, it's always great just seeing her on the screen. I mean, just look at her, she's perfect. In particular, I always just love seeing her be a complete bitch to Rance, far more than any of the other main girls. She continues to help Rance, but you can always tell that she's always extremely reluctant and unhappy about it, which is plenty amusing. Another thing I enjoyed, although it was rather smart and short in the grand scheme of the game, was her interactions with Maria. Just seeing them be there for each other and genuinely care for one another, and their few funny interactions as they flew over to the island were all super great. While the fact that the four witches from Rance 2 do in fact care about each other isn't some unknown secret, just actually seeing more of that hero was quite nice. Knowing about her main goal in life, trying to prevent her father's murder or avenging the person who killed him to the point where she absolutely refuses to die, makes me extremely interested in how her character will continue to go. Especially seeing how Rance continues to interfere in her plans, it makes me wonder how their dynamic would be by the end of the series, or even just from game to game. I'm super excited to see where it all ends up. Plus, she's still the hottest girl so far, and if you disagree, you're wrong. Tanami is also present here too, and while she doesn't go for some mind-blowing development, this game does start to add more layers to her as well. In Rance 3, her main traits, I guess, are being absolutely loyal to Princess Leia, to the point of not really giving a shit of what happens to her herself, and then also playing the role as a straight man of sorts to Rance's bullshit. While I did find her plenty entertaining in Rance 3, I was also definitely looking forward to when they'd add more to her character in future entries, and this game starts to give a taste of that. Hanami is obviously very loyal to Leia, and definitely appreciates her, but there's still a part of her that just wants to be a normal girl deep down, and the fact that she's normally always stuck with Leia means that she essentially has to erase her own will most of the time. However, due to her being apart from Leia basically the whole time in this game, She's allowed to actually have more of a free will and partake in hobbies and try out other things that she normally wouldn't be able to do. This game also features the first time she actively disobeys that Leah commanded her to do. While she sometimes had failed or messed up during jobs, she had never gone against Leah out of her own will. I won't explain how or why it happens, but the particular scene was another one of my favorites. I apologize for once again repeating myself, but I can't wait to see how her character continues to change and develop through the series. Of course, there's plenty of other characters who continue to return from the first three games, which is always exciting to see. Phyllis continues to show up in her role as Rance's demon after being made a servant in Rance 3. While she's no longer a character you can summon in battle, she's still plenty enjoyable whenever she shows up. Rance actually starts to utilize her power in some pretty great ways to progress the plot and give her some sticky situations, which further had proven a point I made in my previous video about Rance actually being able to be a commendable strategist at times even if you may think he's just an arrogant and dumb asshole. I love her, and I hope she continues to be in each entry going forward. Layla was another character who initially showed up in Rance 3, and while she didn't do too much in the game, she got a little bit more spotlight here too. Nothing too omega crazy, but more screen time is always nice, so she has a bit more of a presence to me. My favorite moment involving her was probably her being a beacon of support and helping Maria out after they landed on the island. She started to help Maria confront her feelings, as due to her poor self-esteem and other circumstances, Maria was struggling to handle her emotions, especially what it means to fall in love. The last character I'll give some attention to will be kind of a special case, Athena 2.0. She's actually a completely optional recruitable character, as you have to go out of your way to obtain her. I guess because of this, she doesn't really have any main part of the story, outside of a few side scenes. From what I gather, she'll mainly get to play a part in 4.1 and 4.2. But from the little bit of her that I got to experience here, I honestly like her, maybe more than I should. She's basically a man-made person to try and be the most perfect being. 
But the main aspect of her is that she's actually just really stupid. I've consistently called Rance pretty dumb, but take his dumb energy and amplify it up to 100. She's just a plain a goober, and honestly, I'm here for that vibe. When she dies in battle, she literally just has a key match, and she also parks in battle. It's just so goofy, I love it. At first, if you try to invite her to Rance's room, you find out that she was created without the necessary parts to, well, you know. Which is a fucking hilarious scene. After going back and forth to her original creators, you eventually solve this problem, with some rather comedic dialogue in the process. While the side quest gameplay itself is rather repetitive, the actual content is pretty damn funny. I don't know if she'll have any deep story role later on, but I'm definitely just looking forward to more of her goofy antics. Those are all of the characters I mainly wanted to cover here. That's not to say none of the other characters are worth talking about or something, but these are just the ones that I want to talk about the most. Plus, this happened to include the ones that'd be easiest to go into without going into more spoiler territory. Now, the last main thing to cover is about some of the actual story. I've gone in depth about all these characters, but how about the actual plot itself? What's actually kind of interesting to note about this game is that not a whole lot happens throughout the plot. This game is about 20 to 25 hours long, but over the course of it, most of the actual content is. I hate using the word filler, but stuff that isn't really fully relevant to the story at hand. It is a bit of a contrast in comparison to Rance 3, which did actually have a pretty big scale plot going on the whole time. But that's perfectly fine by me, and to have some crazy plot going on, we instead get a lot more focus on specific character interactions and dynamics, as well as more of a focus on building more things about the world for the whole Rance series. What this game adds is a lot of super fascinating things for the past and lore of the world that Rance is in, and things that I'm sure future entries will elaborate on and add more depth to. I'm super eager to see how each entry will continue to add more and more content about the world. But for the sake of completing this video, I'll go into a little of an introduction of how the story starts off. After the ending of Rance 3, Rance basically fucking pissed off a demon king and god, so he was sent through purgatory. When he and Syl awaken, they find that they're abandoned off on some new island, a place completely different and separate from their original content. Rance is completely naked, and Syl only has her one outfit with no money, items, or weaponry to speak of. Rance's level also got dropped down to 1 2, as another fuck you act from God. After coming across a small town and asking some questions, they're able to fully confirm that they're on the floating island called Yalapu, which is an island floating far above places. After questioning the locals, who at first were extremely excited about seeing visitors, they're made with the harsh reality of it being supposedly impossible to leave. As Rance continues to be like, yeah, no way I'm letting myself die alone here away from all of my women, he and Syl proceed to find a way to escape the island. Shortly after, we find out that Princess Leia, or I guess the Queen now, sends a group of Rance's previous allies, plus a new face or two, to rescue him from the island, as she's able to spot his location from a crystal ball with Maris. And of course, she's extremely bummed that she can't save him herself. What adds to the original conflict is the appearance of the Hellman army, who are there in order to revive a broken robot weapon that existed hundreds of years in the past. So that's about all I specifically want to cover about Rance 4, the legacy of the sect. As I'm sure you can tell, I really enjoyed this game. The gameplay has a lot of flaws, and I definitely preferred how Rance 3 felt to play, but I still have a soft spot for some of the aspects here too. But I absolutely loved what this game did for the characters and world of this game, enough for me to honestly overlook the gameplay for the most part. Seeing as each character becomes more enjoyable to experience and receive more depth to them, it's just so exciting. If you can't already tell, I'm super attached to so many of these guys already. I'm beyond excited to see how they all develop and continue to change, as well as just receiving more content for them too. This same feeling is something I had of other of my top favorite series, such as Monogatari and Trails. And getting to feel those same emotions is one aspect I'm already loving about this franchise too. Plus, not just the characters, but knowing that the world is going to become even richer and more interesting itself is super cool too. I'm beyond looking forward to continuing this franchise, and continuing to make more and more videos for my journey along the way too. While this wasn't nearly as much of an introductory video to Rinse as my first one, if this has maybe encouraged anyone else to try these games too, That'd be really cool! I love sharing my excitement about stuff, and I can't wait to go into the rest of these games as well. Thanks for watching!